Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, the first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, this is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, but rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a a more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. This episode of Books and Boba is brought to you by First Republic Bank. The world is changing and your needs are evolving. As your focus turns to what matters most to you and your community, First Republic remains committed to offering personalized financial solutions that fit your needs. From day one, you'll be connected with a dedicated banker who will serve as your primary point of contact throughout your relationship with the bank. They'll be there to listen to you, understand your values, and meet you on your financial journey. Your banker can offer solutions that support your goals at any stage, from setting up a personal checking account, to refinancing household debt, to buying a first home. As your needs evolve, you can call or email your banker at any time for the support you need. Because First Republic believes what matters to you matters most. Learn more at firstrepublic.com. That's firstrepublic.com. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. You're listening to... Whoa! Hot luck. Hot luck. Hey everyone, Happy New Year. You're listening to Books and Boba, the book club and podcast between books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And we're here today to talk about the Books and Boba December 2020 book club pick, When Dimple Met Rishi by Sandhya Menon. Our last book pick for 2020 um, and our first episode for 2021. Uh, Rira, Happy New Year. Yes, Happy we made New it. Year. We made it to the end of 2020. How do you feel? Uh, I feel more or less the same. <laughs> um, usually this time of um, of the year, my depression gets pretty bad, but I've been I've been pretty mellow, which is kind of surprising. Um, I think the world is still on fire. <laughs> Somehow I feel like that's the opposite of everyone else. This time of year, everyone seems to be more hopeful, but it seems this year everyone's a lot more cynical. Uh, because of what 2020 did to us. So um, some might say 2020, the great equalizer for our feelings for a new year. I, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what did you do for your New Year's? How how was it? I didn't do anything. Usually I um, go out for okay, dinner. That, that my... is a good question. What do you <laughs> usually do? And what did you do this year? Well, usually... For New Year's Eve, my family likes to have a big family dinner. We do like a roast beef. Um, we do like a roast um, prime rib or um, a ham. Um, but this year, my parents are both right now in. Uh, but this year, my parents are both in Asia, and so we didn't really do anything. Um, hung out with my girlfriend um, over the phone, and then we like did the countdown by Animal Crossing, which was That's interesting. Really cute, yeah. <laughs> But other than that, nothing really, it's been a pretty chill holiday season. And 
gotta say I don't mind it. Uh, but at the same time, it felt like it was a blur. Like, can you believe that we're, I guess, what, month nine of locking ourselves down? Um, yeah, I can believe it. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Like, I, I guess because I'm an introvert and um, because I'm like pretty familiar with working from home, um, it really wasn't that much of a change to me. And same thing with like, um, with like the holiday season, it was really nice to just have it for myself and for, for Dan and not deal with family and um, just like focus on us. And like, that was, that was really nice. And I know for a lot of people uh, not seeing their family was, was a really big bummer, but I also know some people who, you know, it was, it was really nice to be away from family drama and just celebrate Christmas and, um, and New Year's with just their own immediate family. So um, I think it was like, yeah, like you said, it, it was an equalizer <laughs> this year. I mean, I don't know about you, but besides this podcast and the other podcasts that I do, I don't really talk to people anymore. And so I feel like my communication skills have like gone rusty, so to say. Oh, that's like, really I don't funny. know if we're, once we get out of this, if I'll be able to function in society anymore or if I'm just going to be a hermit for life. Like I might actually just become a shut in. I mean, <laughs> like I, I, I've always been a shut in. So <laughs> let me tell you that life is not that bad. <laughs> not, not talking to people is pretty great. Although like my job requires me to be pretty social. So, um, yeah, yeah it's. It's like, oh, I still have social skills. It's just I don't want to use them. <laughs> <laughs> Unnecessary social skills not needed. Um, yeah, I feel like um, I get that some people really miss being social. But um, because of those impulses right now, like Rira and I both live in Southern California, specifically the L.A. County area. Uh, which is like the and worst yeah, right now, by the way. We are like, I think L.A. County just issued a ordinance to their ambulances to triage in ambulances so if people are gonna die to not admit them uh because our er's are just too full and it sounds like things are a mess and it doesn't feel that way on the surface because everyone wants to believe that where things are getting better with the vaccine and everything and oh man yeah so it's just very frustrating to us because we're actually following the rules but then there are people like for for like the holidays and stuff they I think like my neighbors, they had like 10 people who just showed up for like a holiday party. And I was like, why are you doing this? I'm glad that I'm like not leaving my apartment, but it's uh, it's just like there are so many selfish people. Yeah. And like I get you want a party when it's like the holidays, but I don't know. Like um, I think like this week, because people were selfish, the cases are going to go like way up. Um, but oh, yeah. yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty bad in LA County. I don't expect it to get any better real soon. People are already like, things were already bad after Christmas. Like, like things were already bad after Thanksgiving. It's only gotten worse after Christmas and New Year's definitely made things worse. So, um, yeah, things aren't good. So, um, everyone stay in, read a book. It's better than going out and maybe dying. <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do when you're out anyway? Like, really? Like, there's nothing to do when you go outside. Yeah. Anyway, uh, sorry. Well, like, uh, I, I know, like, we talk a lot about, like, the pandemic, but that's just our reality reality at the moment. So, um, yeah. sorry for being a downer, <laughs> but let's move on to uh, happier things. Yeah. We read a happy book for, for the end of I 2020. Was, I was super glad to have such a light and um, breezy read uh, for last month's book club pick. Um I tried really hard. It was um, Mar only Marvin would know this, but I, I was just like, I like, I don't know what to pick. A lot of the books that I had in mind for this year, they were like more serious, and I know people don't want to read them. Um, like, what what do we read? And we just decided on When Dimple Met Rishi because uh, it's just been on our list for a very long time, and we just never had never had a chance to read it yeah 
Um, and so I'm really glad that yeah. we, we got to it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a long time since we've read a breezy YA rom com, so um, definitely a good palate cleanser. Um, yeah, rom com for the year. <laughs> but yeah, let's get to it. Um, Rira, why don't you start us off with the book jacket description? Okay, so the book jacket description goes. Dimple Shaw has it all figured out. With graduation behind her, she's more than ready for a break from her family and from Mama's inexplicable obsession with her finding the ideal Indian husband. Ugh. Dimple knows they must respect her principles on some level, though. If they truly believe she needed a husband right now, they wouldn't have paid for her to attend a summer program for aspiring web developers, right? Rishi Patel is a hopeless romantic, so when his parents tell him that his future wife will be attending the same summer program, wherein he'll have to woo her, he's totally on board, because as silly as it sounds to most people in his life, Rishi wants to be in an arranged marriage and believes in the power of tradition, stability, and being a part of something much bigger than himself. The Shahs and Patels didn't mean to start turning the wheels on this suggested arrangement so early in their children's lives, but when they noticed them both gravitating toward the same summer program, they figured, why not? Dimple and Rishi may think they have each other figured out, but when opposites clash, love works hard to prove itself in the most unexpected ways. Yeah. So Rira, as the more well-versed rom-com person, what did you think about the rom communists of this story? I thought it was pretty cute. Um, I like the the arc of the relationship. So you go from uh, just like one sided uh, infatuation slash hatred to friends to I sort of like this person and then a full on relationship and like a very emotional breakup and then, you know, getting back together at the end. So I really like that journey. Um, I like the fact that it wasn't all romance. Um, I like the fact that like both of them as friends were pushing each other to be, uh, their best selves and, uh, how they were trying to support each other's dreams. Like I thought that was like really important, um, not just for the friendship overall, but like in their romantic relationship. Um, but yeah, like I thought it was a pretty... I don't want to say normal, but it was like a very familiar <laughs> um, vibe to it. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the romance-ness of it, um, definitely a couple of steamy kiss scenes. Um, and I think this is just my brain being broken from reading too much more adult stuff. But like, I was a little let down that they like glossed through the actual, you know, doing it. Um, oh my god, that's so hilarious. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm like, oh, I guess it is a YA book. I guess they can't go that graphic. I mean, it was it was like, that's really funny because I'm just remembering our first book for Books and Boba, Heroin Complex. And um, uh, the sex scenes there were pretty tame. And I remember Marvin being like, oh my god, this is, <laughs> this is a lot. <laughs> but over the years, Marvin has... Um, built up tolerance i guess towards uh gooey romance scenes and sexy steamy <laughs> scenes some might call it tolerance others just knowledge i did not know what i did not know and now that i do i can't not know right i like the fact that uh it did have a steamy part like um i wasn't expecting the sex part at all um which just goes to show like my preconceived notions about uh just YA relationships in general and also um Indian American relationships. I was like, oh, okay, like two Indian American teens are having sex at summer camp. I don't know why that seemed so surprising to me, but it was. Um it kind of showed like my it kind of like pushed my own um I guess like viewpoints on things. Um yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I didn't I, I I guess I wasn't expecting them to be so horny. Although I mean they're they're like 18 years old, so I'm like, oh <laughs> yeah, like this is this is something that that teenagers go through. I think 
because my high school experience and like my early college experience was pretty different. I was like, oh, okay, this is like, like, this is a typical thing for a lot of teenagers. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, um, I'm definitely what you would call a late bloomer. I don't know about you, Rira. Uh, Yeah, same here. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah, but. I, I guess that's why I was surprised, right? <laughs> like, I, guess. I was like, oh, I didn't like get into like a serious relationship until towards like the end of my college years. So but yeah, at I was the like, same time, 18 years old, you're you're gonna take this relationship that seriously. Okay. <laughs> but at the same time, I definitely knew friends and people from school um that were doing it. So I, I know it definitely happened, it just didn't happen around me. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, good for Dimple and Rishi, I guess. I mean, I yeah, I like I liked how um like like we said, like this is this is an experience that other people have. So I I I do like that realism. Like it wasn't just glossed over. Yeah. Although I do remember like when I was in high school, I went to a lot of like overnighter conferences, and I wonder thinking back if i missed any signs like could this have happened to me Hmm. oh well it's in the past i've never been to like a summer program (laughs) like this um yeah yeah i mean i guess that's what um i know one of the complaints for the story was how the romance moved real quickly but just from experience having you know um gone to even like a weekender um, type of thing where you're meeting people from different schools and like being forced into new social situations. Um, I feel like when you go to a place like this, where you, especially the first time you're like away from home and away from parent supervision, the way relationships grow feels compressed. Also, so, there's a deadline too. Yeah. Cause you know that like the program is going to end. So you purposely kind of speed things up yeah uh get the maximum experience that you can before (laughs) going back to the real world i mean yeah we've seen this we've seen this in in other mediums too you know love boat um those types of like summer programs where you're just um you're away from home for the first time like there's something about like feeling like you're an independent adult for the first time even though you're still 18 and still a kid i can say that now now that i'm like 30 something um 18 year olds are kids um i feel like the development was realistic because i've seen it happen that quickly you know yeah yeah and you have dimple and rishi they're working together on a project and you're they're spending a lot of time together like it's um yeah yeah so like obviously you will get close pretty fast uh even though like they kind of started on the wrong foot well i mean (laughs) We can talk about that, right? Like they started on the wrong foot because they um, essentially at the beginning of the story there, I don't even know if they're actually paired as an arranged marriage, but they were being floated as like a possible like pairing, right? Like, I don't think. I mean, that's story, how it works, does isn't it though? I, I don't know. I'm not. I don't. I, I mean, don't, I don't have enough Indian friends to like my ask. my knowledge comes from. um one Indian friend and uh, watching the Indian matchmaking show on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it it seems like they go through, like, they have a possible match. They have the kids, like, talk it out. And if they feel like they can do a marriage, have a long-term relationship, then they go for it. Um, yeah, because, like, usually when people think arranged marriage, they think that the bride and groom are being forced into a relationship but uh nowadays it seems like uh the possible couple have more of a choice yeah especially if you're not like super rich right because i feel like if you're part of like the upper class like i feel like there's still such a thing as political marriages but when you're like you know common middle class of people um i think i don't know like again i don't know enough about the culture to really comment on um, what th- their mindsets are. But what I do know is um, the initial conflict isn't because there isn't chemistry, because there obviously is initial attraction. Um, it's just the fact that where these two characters are at the beginning. And I, I think we can go into their characterizations, right? Like um, Dimple is characterized as an independent, like Indian American woman who, you know, just wants her parents to accept her and her passions and not try to force her to be what they want 
And, you know, it's a pretty common um, trope in Asian American literature, right? Your parents want you to follow their path because they think that's what's best for you because of what they experience as immigrants. But from the perspective of the child, it's like they're trying to force you to be something when you're not. And in Dimple's case, it's she doesn't want to be a pretty like she doesn't want to just be a pretty face and she doesn't want her entire reason for being to like attract the husband. Yeah. And I don't think this is strictly in um, I don't think it's strictly like an immigrant parent uh, experience. I think a lot of um, I think a lot of teenagers have have this experience of their parents wanting them to live a different life from them. And there is a bit of rebellion. And uh, especially if you're a girl, there's there's a lot of expectations for you to just um, go to college to find a husband and uh, like your appearance is first priority. Um, so that part was really familiar, familiar to me. Um, I, <laughs> I, my, my parents like never had, um, like there, like my parents never matched me with anyone, uh, like Dimple and Rishi's parents <laughs> have done, but like, I've definitely had moments where my parents would be like, oh, go meet this person. Like they might be your future husband, like impress them. And it's. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like it's such a weird uh pressure that a lot of uh women face and uh I could definitely relate to Dimple being very frustrated with her parents and uh kind of like having this conflicting relationship with her mom who really wants her to get married early and have babies. Yeah. Yeah, in that first chapter I really related to Dimple because I remember that feeling of like the entire senior year where you're just waiting to go to college. And especially for me, since I was going away for the first time, like, you know, two hours away, I went to college in San Diego, but that's far enough to be like independent. And I was just so excited to like not live at home, not have to deal with, you know, just parents and whatever. Um, and like that, that feeling of like just being just so close to freedom was really relatable. And you can tell that um, Dimple like really, really desired that, even though it's obvious that she loves her parents. Um, she also was looking forward to like going away for the first time. And I definitely related to the fact that like her parents didn't want her to go to Stanford um, because it was a private school, um, but they let her anyways, which is the opposite of what happened to me because I had wanted to go to private school. I got into um, USC actually um, early admissions, but my dad wouldn't let me go because in his words, private school is for grad school. Um, which he, I mean, that, I mean, the thing is like, if you are going to grad school, yeah, kind <laughs> of, um, uh, which coincidentally he doesn't remember telling me or chooses not to remember telling me. I, I think we bring this up like pretty often immigrant parents, they have selective memory. Yeah. Um, that's, that's really funny because like for my family, it was the complete opposite. Uh, they said that if I don't go to a private school, they will like they were not joking. They said that they would disown me. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> every single school that I applied for was a private school. Wow. And um, I happened to go to the school that was pretty much like not the other side of the country, but it was like very far away. <laughs> so it was very thrilling to uh, have that independence. Yeah. Um, but I do like the fact that you mentioned uh, Dimple having respect for her parents. Um, I think it would have been really easy for her to just be like a resentful, rebellious daughter. Um, and I like the fact that like that Dimple and Rishi, they respect their parents in different ways. And um, the pressures that they face are pretty similar, but the way they deal with them are very different. Yeah, I mean, Rishi himself has a, like, another common Asian American immigrant child trope, which is he's a secret artist um, who's, you know, going to get an engineering degree to um, appease his parents. And um, at first, I kind of, like, yeah, at first, at first, I did, wasn't sure if I liked him. Like, he seemed likable enough, but he was also kind of, like, Oh, same kind here. Of a wuss, right? Kind of a pushover. 
in terms of I mean of not like, not like a pushover like cuz cuz I can understand like I I went to art school but <laughs> uh the reason why like he kind of had like the like not a great impression for for me was just like how he approached Dimple like I, <laughs> like right. him being like hello future wife and I was like what the fuck man like like you don't go up to someone and and like introduce yourself like that that was so funny because um i didn't know what so, so sanya Menon's like um dimple mitrishi series is famous for their covers right and i know i knew that um the original cover for when dimple mitrishi um in, has like an indian girl with an iced coffee so i didn't know whether that iced coffee was going to play a role in the story and oh, it's funny because <laughs> in the back cover it shows her throwing iced coffee really uh, yeah oh, see i had the kindle version so I, I i don't have i don't have a visual of that but yeah like i it, it's it was a very funny dramatic first meeting yeah not not uh definitely not your usual rom-com meet cute oh no it wasn't a meet cute it was um <laughs> it was a meat disaster <laughs> um but you're right like at the beginning of the story um rishi is so like I, and I guess this is his like first son, like golden boy ness of his like position in his, in his family, but he like had like absolute confidence that things were going to work out for him because of his parents' plan, right? Like he totally bought into the whole um, Asian parent Kool Aid, and like things are be great. I'm going to get an engineering degree. I'm going to have start a family, have kids, and I'm going to be happy, right? And like it really seems like he believes it, and. That to me, like, yeah, that to me was like, oh. Yeah, and like the fact that he didn't even consider um, what the girl would be going through. Because it's like... Well, for, he assumed for, like, that she wanted the same thing, right? Yeah, exactly. And like at 18 years old, like really? Uh, not considering that like maybe the the girl doesn't want a family. Uh, the uh, amount of sacrifice that would take on her part it just flew over his head and i'm just like okay i yeah. guess that's like first son golden boy privilege you know like privilege and also you, like burden right because he also fully assumes that she's the same as him which is like someone who will will be willing to like sacrifice their own passion for the sake of their parents dreams yeah right um, I think it's a you know in terms and in, in like in terms of rom com pairings, it's a pretty good pairing, like ripe with um conflicts, right? Like just both of their outlooks in life and their responsibilities as like individuals. Yeah. Um, but Rishi warmed like I warmed up to Rishi when uh like at that dinner with the not dinner was it dinner but whatever at that the fancy meal restaurant? yeah with the Abra zombies. <laughs> I I was just like okay I'm. Like I, I, I'm starting to like you because you're just like the, the the coolness of him just putting these these uh, racist assholes down. I guess and just like protecting Dimple. I was like, <laughs> okay, yeah, like respect. I guess, and from my perspective, I kind of felt like he was like, I don't know, like fronting a little too hard. He was making a big show to like put the other people down and to protect dimple um but that was also like against what she wanted right and i mean the entire scene was him doing things that he wanted to do because he thought that it would impress her right he paid for the whole dinner um and he like um he like put an effort in putting down the obvious like the people who were bullying her but i don't know part of me part of me was a little like squicked out by it too because he was being like kind of aggressive. I I guess um I did feel weird about him paying for the group's meal. Um and I do understand that like he was going against what Dimple wanted and um you know like you should respect um your friend's wishes but you know it's like it's it's hard as a friend to see see them like being kind of like steamrolled over. And um, to see someone who's like as fierce and outspoken as Dimple uh, just kind of like shrink in in the company of like these really immature, uh, privileged, rich 
sons and daughters. It's um, it's just like, yeah, like I like I felt what he did was um, I don't know. It was like <laughs> it was a it was like a well-intentioned gest- gesture. Yeah. And I guess I respected it because uh, it's totally something that I would do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's it's definitely something I have done for for some friends in the past. So, yeah, I guess I guess I was more forgiving. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes it easier that the the villains of the story are kind of cartoonishly villainous. Um, like, I don't know they if had, they were cartoonish. I've they had like totally, no redeeming qualities, like zero. Redeeming no, qualities. I've <laughs> I've met teens who had <laughs> no redeeming qualities. So I was just like, yeah, and and also like, um. I like the fact that like one of the quote unquote villains was Hari, who is also Indian American, and um and you have uh, you have uh, Rishi's brother Ashish uh, or Ashish, sorry. Um, so you have four different types of Indian American teens. So it was like nice to see uh, differences in their personalities and their outlook. Yeah. That was something that I did notice um, having had friends from the Bay Area um, is I don't think there were enough Asians in this story. Because if you think about it, a summer camp for techie web developers in San Francisco, that camp is definitely 99% Asian. And I get that we don't really get to see a lot of the other people in this camp. But, like, just from personal experience, like, there's no way that camp wasn't just all Asians. There's no way that they were the only Indian people in the entire camp, too. Probably, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but like you said, they're, they're probably off camera, off the page. That's true. Which, I mean, I get that you need this for the plot, but there's no way that Dimple and Rishi were the only Indian dance in that talent show. It would have been really funny if they were competing against a team, against another like Bollywood dance. Or like Bhangra uh, or like some other like, you know, like, yeah, like I know it's for the plot and it, it was a good scene. Um, I love that there was. And I, don't know, I guess, would you call it an obligatory Bollywood dance scene or an Indian American rom-com? Um, I don't know because I haven't read enough Indian American <laughs> rom-coms to know if like a Bollywood dance scene is is you know, like canon. But I feel like a lot of these in like Asian American, um, especially like high school or teen rom coms, there's at some point there is a culture show component to it. Um, you know, it happened in Love Boat Taipei. Uh, we see it here. I don't know. I think, you know, it's not like, it's, I'm not saying it's a bad trope. Um, I did enjoy it, but I felt like, you know, when, when I read that part, I was like, oh, of course, of course they're going to have a cultural dance scene. Why not? I think it's just like a good visual aid to like show that like you are accepting the motherland culture. So yeah, like um I did like the fact that Dimple was um was like pretty timid about performing the Bollywood routine. Cause she like sh- like she's usually like so confident in her coding abilities and um she has like such solid goals for like what she wants out of this camp. But she's like uh but you know, but she's like she has stage fright and she doesn't want people to to see her and there's a lot of anxieties. So I, I really thought that was like a good character component to her. Yeah, I think that's that's just her character, right? Like, like she's confident in her abilities as a coder and as someone who, you know, wants to make it as an independent woman, but she's not confident in her like abilities as a traditional woman, you know, in terms of like looks, in terms of charisma and things like that. It also gives an opportunity for Rishi to uh, be supportive of her. And um I thought it was a really nice scene where like right before they go on stage and how he like comforts her and gives her confidence. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing I wish was in the book more was the coding aspect. <laughs> you know, like they they talk about like the app and how hard they worked, but we don't really get to see much of the process or the final product. I mean, this is a rom com, so like what they actually do and their profession is secondary to the rom 
ness of it. Um, it's like, you know, <laughs> it's like always be my maybe, right? Do we really see um, Ali Wong's character do a lot of cooking? No, we see montages of her doing cooking. Um, <laughs> so showing the nitty grittiness of the coding, which is getting in the way of the rom-com of it. Well, it's it's not that, that I want the nitty grittiness. Like I would have liked um, kind of like a final presentation scene, you know, like they do their pitch and yeah. then you have the Abra zombies do their pitch. And then when you find out that the Abra zombies won because of nepotism, I, I guess there's like more of a shock factor. Yeah, I do feel like the pitch scene was missing from this story. I mean, yeah, having like a technical issue that they um, overcome together would have been a good um, story point as well. And I wonder if um, it did exist, but it had to be like taken out because of um, pacing. Yeah. Yeah. Because in a way, I feel like the, the third act and the conclusion it moved really fast um, compared to the rest of the book. Um, and I guess that's just how rom-coms are. Um, but what did you think about uh, their first non-date that turned into a date? I mean, I thought it was pretty obvious what he was planning. Did you, did you think that it was creepy? A little bit. Yeah, same here. I mean, yeah, it's obvious that he had no intention of it being a non-date. And I don't know. I've had my fair shirts of like awkward first dates, but I've definitely had um, I like I've I definitely had a moment where I've been tricked into a date where like I thought that it was a non date, but like the party like definitely planned it to be a date. And let <laughs> me tell you, it's really creepy and very uncomfortable. Uh, it's a good thing that Dimple actually likes Rishi. But um, yeah, it was like a little bit creepy to me. Um, yeah, I was, but it was also very endearing because he like he knows that he messed up and he's like trying to abort the plan. But the but the <laughs> waiter at the, but the waiter at like the book bar like is not getting the hint. And I was just like picturing this as like as if it was a movie. So like the whole visual scene seemed pretty funny to me. Yeah, I mean, I didn't necessarily buy that she was okay with it um but um yeah it was definitely just one of those things that he did would have been enough but he did so many things and it was it was kind of sweet when um she finds out that he picked the books and bought them and um i like i said it was a little bit creepy because it was a little bit too much but in the end, it was like, okay, yeah, like, it was sweet that he thought about her, thought out her present. And I like, I like the fact that, like, Dimple took him to, like, to, to see the view of the city and him drawing her. I thought that was, like, a really nice scene as well. Yeah. So the date ended well. Yeah, I think the romance part of the story is pretty, like, I mean, it's, it's definitely the highlight and definitely the, the focus of the story. Um, but it's it's pretty cute, pretty sweet. It's good to see that they're both good for each other, you know. Even though Rishi is super pushy, yeah, but she's pushy too. She submitted his art to to like his uh to his like artist hero, and like I don't it, like it was out of bound. And her saying like you should share your gift with the world, it would be a crime. And it's like yeah, but that's not what he wanted, and um. I think that's a little different than like him like saying, oh, it's not going to be a date, but it's definitely going to be a date. I'm going to force you to go on a date with me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like my, my point is like she was also pushy and um, she did also like make mistakes and step out of out of bounds. Um, but like but like the romance, I, th I think for the most part, it was organic. Um, and I think it really was like a teen romance, you know, cause it has like all of those awkward moments and trying to figure out like what dating is like. And I really like the breakup aspect, uh, the breakup arc of this book. Yeah. Um, what stood out for you in terms of this one? I don't know. Maybe I just really like angst like teen angst but uh i like the breakup scene like really stood out to me because um uh sometimes sometimes like 
like a lot like I read on Goodreads and some people complained about like how quickly she went from like being totally in love to oh and now I have to break up with him um and like with they they said it was too quick but I think that anxiety and that um just like the constant thought of like is this going to work how are we going to make it work and then have one thing trigger uh the decision to break up I think that's pretty pretty realistic um and i like the fact that she she says to him like i want to focus on my career i never wanted this relationship and um like her worrying if they met too early and um if like if she decided to continue seeing him like is she already sealing off everything that she wants and um i thought that was like a pretty good reason to break up and um sometimes like sometimes when you like really love each other like sometimes that's not enough so i did like that breakup scene but like i said it's a rom-com so there has to be like (laughs) a happy ending so i i mean not that i had a problem with the ending but i really liked the breakup scene and the build-up towards that yeah i mean at that point they're both really into their relationship, but at the same time, they're also both being pushed to give up something. Um, for Dimple, it's giving up on her focus on her career, being the type of independent woman she wants to be for this thing that she didn't necessarily want or didn't necessarily know that she wanted. Um, and that's scary for her. And for Rishi, it's, you know, to be together with Dimple means that she's going to push him to do what he really wants to do, uh, which is be an artist. And that scares the crap out of him. I mean, I think Rishi, his internal struggle with being the perfect son for his parents. I know that he feels like he, he does feel betrayed at that moment when he finds out that she submitted his art without his knowledge. Um, But at the same time, like he's also realizing that like, he can't stay as he is if he if he wants to be with her, too. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you made a really good point with that. And also, like, him being the perfect son uh, not only affects his relationship with Dimple and um, just, like, his career, but also with his younger brother. Because his younger brother is like, you're the perfect son. Whatever I do is not going to be good enough. And uh, just, like, the... Like him being like, I want to do what I want to do. I want to be who I want to be. Um, I think like I think the sibling dynamic was um, pretty well developed. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely a thing that happens, especially if you have two boys um, that are close together in age, uh, which is the the older sibling gives cover for the younger sibling to kind of do what they want to do. Um, I say that from personal experience as an older brother. Yeah, I'm also like uh I I'm also the oldest and it's <laughs> it, it's like you're when you're the firstborn child, your parents are usually pretty strict and it's and then like when they have like the second or third kid, they're like, "Oh, like it's fine." <laughs> um they they give up earlier. Um I think I said this earlier, but I do feel like the parents relationship arc of the, you know, the 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 final of the conclusion Wrapped up a little too cleanly. I feel like for someone who is has such a big impact on Rishi's life and his decisions on what he should do, I think that his father gave in way too easily um, for an Asian parent um, in terms of accepting his son's artistic pursuits. Um, but I also know that, you know, um, it's all like we're at the end of the book. You can't like add in a whole other arc where you're trying to convince the dad that you're you're into art. Yeah, I would have liked to see a conversation, like the conversation that he has with his dad. Yeah, it happened and, off screen, right? A lot of that stuff, like the parents, like a lot of his like resolution with his parents happened off screen. So again, it gets montaged away. Because like Dimple had that scene. The, yeah. Because like Dimple had that scene with her mother and like Dimple expressing like, I feel like a disappointment. I feel like you want to push me into this perfect housewife role that I'm never going to be. And her mom saying, like, I'm not disappointed in you. 
um, like all I want is for you to be happy. And I just kind of wish that Rishi had that conversation with his parents. Uh, I think it would have been like a good parallel to to like dimple scene with her with her mother. But like you said, you can only fit so much into a book and you're already at like the end of the book. So um, I was pretty forgiving about that. Um, yeah. God, wait, so so does that mean like they're not doing long distance anymore? No, because she's going to Stanford. And I mean, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, he's... Palo Alto to San Francisco is not close, but that's just a part right away. So, I mean, it's definitely closer than Bay Area and um, Boston. What did you think about the concluding scenes where like, you know, the part where they're chasing each other, but missing each other coincidentally? Um, oh, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was great. It was very cinematic, it was, right? You can kind of It was very it. cinematic. <laughs> yeah, it was very cinematic. And also just, um, I don't know, it was, it was, it was very rom-com. <laughs> and very K-drama in a way, too. Because in K-dramas, there's always airport running scene. <laughs> So I was just like, yes, yes. <laughs> I was so into it. So that was cute. Um, I'm glad that they ended up together. I mean, how could they not, right? It's it's it would be a pretty sad rom. I mean, I can see a romance where they didn't end up together and they just like four years down the line they meet each other at like a startup where like yeah. she's she's doing the app, she's like she's developing the app and he's like signing on as a graphic designer. But that that would be more of an adult book. <laughs> You know, like that's something that would happen in adult romance. That's true. Um, I, I mentioned this before we recorded, but I wouldn't have minded a direct sequel to uh, to Dimple and Rishi's romance. Like I would have liked to see how they handle their romantic relationship while they're in college and how the long distance would kind of strain their relationship. Uh, would they be allowed to date other people? What's going to happen if one of them studies abroad? Like, I wish I like uh, there's so many different types of scenarios that just kind of ran into my head when I reached the book, reached the end of the book. I mean, I feel like that's par for the course for any like teen rom-com, because I mean, these romance, um, these stories always end with a couple getting together. And so like what they do from then on is to your imagination you know you want to yeah, assume that they yeah. live happily ever after but uh, that's not a given and i guess what do you think do you think these two kids um stay together i think they break up again perfectly to be perfectly honest i mean if you just look at how um long distance relationships usually end and how college romances i mean they're close enough to end. like be able to see each other whenever they want to but like I said, like, like, what if, you know, what if there's like other love interests? Right. Like the conflict you know? will be that she gets paired up with a lab partner who's like also super hot. And he starts making you art friends and they both start like kind of drifting off into their own worlds. Right. I think that's that's, yeah, where that's, the how, that's what it ha- that's what happens there. Well, like when you grow up, like you don't stay as the same person. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think they would probably break up again and um, like after they graduate college, maybe give it a try again. Yeah. I don't know. I'm a pretty cynical person when it comes to relationships. <laughs> and yet you're a fan of the rom-com. Because it's it's a fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> I say this as someone who is still with um, my college boyfriend, so... I'm kind of a hypocrite in <laughs> in this regard. It's, I'm like college romances don't work out, and uh, people break up over long distance, and it's like no, what a like, poser. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, what did you think about Ashish and uh, Celia's relationship? We haven't we haven't talked about Celia all that much. I liked Celia. Um, I was kind of like I wished that she was characterized as someone who was also super into coding um, because I think it would have been a good character to have someone who's into her looks, but also into being a badass coder. But I think she was there to represent like the rich kids who aren't complete jerks. Yeah, there was definitely, there was definitely some discrimination towards rich kids (laughs) in this, in this book. Not all rich kids are terrible. Uh, Some rich kids are very um, aware of their, actually no, Rishi, 
Rishi is technically rich, so yeah, yeah, he breaks that stereotype. Yeah. But he also definitely has like rich kid privilege, right? Like being able to pay off an entire table. Like I can understand if it was just him and her. Like if if, if, if it was just him and Dimple on that date and he like decides to pay for everything. But like he drops his card for like the entire table, including the Aber zombies. And I mean, A, that's a baller move, but B, who does that? Um, rich <laughs> kids, rich people. Yes. They do that. Yeah. He did th- he did the Asian thing of like getting the check before everyone else. That's true. But that only like I feel like that that w- it would be more believable if it was like with her parents or with people that he actually likes. Like you don't pick up the check for people you don't like. Yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, it was the only way to to get Dimple to be comfortable. But uh, back to Ashish and Celia, um, that was unexpected. When it, when they say that they hooked up, I was like, wait, oh, what? I definitely <laughs> expected it. I was like, this is a little suspicious. A, Rishi took a 40-minute shower. B, there's no way that like Celia was that late. Um, I guess you can see maybe she had problems with um Evan, but at the same time, I was I was suspecting it um during that that um that dinner period for sure. I mean, with Celia, I, I thought it was interesting that you know she wanted to have this high school experience of being with the popular kids before going off to college. Um, personally, I don't know anyone who kind of had that mindset and wanted. To be like that, but um, I thought I thought it was a nice characteristic. I can um, see that. I mean, yeah, I can I can see it. It's just like not part of my life, <laughs> not, not part of my circle. Yeah, I mean that time period between graduating from high school and going to college is when that's like your first real reflection point, right? Like your first real this is the closing of a chapter. Things like life after this point will never be the same. And you start thinking about things you might have missed out on, you know, um, playing sports, going to dances, doing stuff with friends, doing it, you know, things like that. But um, speaking of Ashish and Celia, I liked that pairing. I liked Ashish a lot. I felt like um, as little brothers go, he was, uh, you know, definitely a softie on the inside. You know, you can tell that he loves his brother and is annoyed that his brother is so like uptight, uh, which is I think it's a common little brother thing as well. And I liked that how he helped coach them through the the Bollywood dance scene. I liked him and Celia together. I don't know. What were your thoughts about Celia and Ashish? Uh, like I said, I was pretty surprised by by the hookup. Um, but I, I, I liked the fact that he was there for Celia. Like he, you know, he, like with the talent show thing, like, I mean, violence is not the answer, but uh, Evan definitely deserved it. <laughs> So I, I like the fact that he actually had guts. Like he wasn't afraid to step up for, for his uh, love interest. Yeah. So what were your thoughts on the dual perspectives? I actually like it a lot. And I know this is something that they do a lot in, in these types of books, which is to get into the heads of both um, romantic leads. And one of my favorite parts of the story is when, when one of them does something really embarrassing and it immediately shifts to their perspective for like a sentence. Um, I think that happened a couple times in the books, um, especially to Rishi. And I, I, I always I always laughed out loud when I read those parts. Yeah, I, I think I enjoyed it too. Um I would I yeah, like it does switch pretty quickly. And I can see how that can be jarring for some people, but I think it worked. I liked it. Yeah. I like that uh, when something embarrassing happens, they immediately switch over. Um, it's something that Sanya does really, really well. And I think I mean, it's kind of like this book's version of comedic timing, right? And I think it's something that Sonia does really well, which is switch the perspectives at the right time to like maximize comedic effect. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and it definitely helps that they're both very different characters. Dimple is more carefree. She goes with the flow um, when she's not you know, in her own head and really likes to mess with Rishi. While Rishi is kind of in his own head all the time. He's super paranoid. Like the the scene where they're at the um, college party and he's just like, there are drugs everywhere. There are drinks. We might get addicted. What are you doing? I, I did like the fact that it was the guy 
in in this rom-com who is a romantic. And I also like the fact that like Rishi has great respect for um his roots and traditions and um uh, I thought it was really cute that he dressed up as his own character for Little Comic Con. <laughs> Uh, I like the fact that he was, you know, he was nerdy in a very different way from Dimple. Yeah, and I guess going back to things that I would have loved to see more, I would have loved to see more, like, it would have been really cool to see his artistic chops, like, come through for her in, like, the app development contest. Yeah, it was just missing the final pitch scene. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but again, the the app design aspect of the story is really there as a setting and a vector to deliver the rom-com. So even though it would have been nice to see, I mean, I, I don't think the story was really missing anything because what we, the audience, really wants to see is these two kids, you know, just work things out. Um, to close things off, um, like for our Goodreads members, uh, they seem to enjoy the book overall. Um, and some, some people read the other books in the series. And uh, they seem to enjoy it, too. Yeah. So I am curious. I'm curious as to uh, reading the sequel with Ashish, uh, you know, getting together with Twinkle. I'm assuming that they get together because it's a rom-com. But, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I read the descriptions for the three books. And it seems like San- I mean, Sanya is definitely a fan of the rom-com. Like Each of the three books has a different, um, like, generic rom-com setup. Like, uh, when Dimple Marishi is your enemies to lover storyline even though the enemy part of it lasted for like a page in a chapter um i think there's something about twinkle is the second one that one is about a contract relationship so like fake relationship and i think the third one's also a fake relationship story too i know we've said like tropes a lot in in this episode and i just want to like clarify that tropes aren't a bad thing no and um also like Like we say that, like sometimes we say, like, oh, it's standard, it's traditional, it's generic, but we haven't seen these stories being told uh, from like an Asian American uh, perspective. We haven't had as many stories in that canon as white protagonists, for example. (laughs) So I think we're allowed to have these tropes and not feel bad that they're familiar. So I just want to clarify that to our readers. We're definitely not dissing tropes or rom-com, rom-com. I mean, there's a reason why there's a whole rom-com production like industry, right? Hallmark movies, Lifetime movies. I mean, (laughs) tropes are tropes for a reason. And we love to see these stories. It's like why it's why like every other romance novel has like almost the same you no know, setup. Yeah, it's 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 not a bad thing. I I'm not like looking down on the tropes. Like <laughs> it's a little funny how like into these tropes I actually am, especially reading them with characters that I can relate to or characters that I'm not used to seeing. I think that's the fun of these stories. It's also fun reading uh teen romances from like an adult point of view it's yeah. like oh you kids you think this is gonna last forever <laughs> it's funny because it seems like Sandia also is a little like you can tell that she really wants to write those love scenes but she can't because it's YA which is why I believe she decided to write her um, adult romance series uh, next um, I think her, her next series of books is an actual adult romance um story uh and she's writing it under a i don't know if it's a pen name or it's just her you know actual american name but like she's writing it as um lily manon instead of sandia manon yeah yeah and i can i can see why she would do that she she wouldn't want young readers to read an adult book thinking <laughs> that it's it's ya i mean we we've personally have uh stumbled into that trap of well not trap but but just thinking that oh this is this is going to be like a lighthearted romance with light scenes. And then it's like, bam, there's a sex scene or a steamy <laughs> scene. And we're like, oh, never mind. Yeah. I can imagine that being uh, more shocking for younger readers. So I can see why she would want a separate <laughs> identity for that. You know, there's a folder on Sandia's um, laptop with all of the Dimple and Rishi's like, love scenes written out graphically. The thing is like... um. Sanja was a self-published author before she went into traditional publishing. I'm not sure if she just wrote romance, but I'm pretty sure she has. Otherwise, she wouldn't be as good at at writing rom-com as she is now. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, she probably has <laughs> some steamy works in her in her folder on her desktop somewhere. <laughs> in her, uh, it's labeled uh, "cutting room smut." I don't like. I, I feel like you have to be a little bit more creative for that folder. <laughs> it's like too too hot to open. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like um, if she ever does a Kickstarter, that'll be kind of like her perks. X-rated cutscenes from the When Diplomat Richie. I feel like that would ruin the book, though. <laughs> like, I mean, it's not I like she would ever it. do that, but <laughs> they. I wonder if there are like straight up uh, sex scenes in the adaptation. Yeah, I mean that's something we haven't mentioned yet, but this um, When Diplomat Richie was adapted into a Netflix series, although it was like, uh, although although the adaptation is really different in terms of setting, I think. Um, the characters are aged up. I think they're young adults in the series and it takes place in India. Um, I haven't seen it yet, so I wouldn't know. Um, but that setting it definitely, everything. yeah, it changes a lot of the context of the relationship. I mean, I think having overbearing parents who want to control your life, it's still, it's still a thing. It's even in Asian countries and some might say, especially in Asian countries. Um, but I don't know. I think, since it was missing that Asian American component, I wasn't as compelled to watch it. I don't know about you. But yeah, yeah, same here. Yeah. But um, if if you guys are planning to watch the adaptation, just go in with the expectation that it's going to be completely different. Yeah. Like, yeah, don't be disappointed <laughs> if <laughs> if certain uh, character aspects are changed or um, the relationship is carved out differently because this is a series. It's not a movie. Yeah. So there will definitely be more, uh, plot points and, uh, I don't know, I guess like more, more drama, I guess. <laughs> so go in with leveled expectations. Yeah. And always remember, even if you're not a, even if the, the TV series doesn't do it for you, you still have the books and the books are great. Um, I had a lot of fun reading this, uh, again, Thank you, Rira, for assigning a light and breezy rom-com to end 2020. Um, it definitely um, was a good palate cleanser. Uh, and, it's, you know, it's it's a fun story. I, I had a lot of fun. I had a good time reading it. Well, I'm really glad because I also wanted to read something <laughs> happy at the end of this year. Yeah. Um, so um, for our listeners, if you have any comments or anything to add to our discussion of Women's Implement Rishi, um, please let us know in our Goodreads forums. It's always great to see um, our members reading along with us and sharing their thoughts. And with that, that'll do it for our discussion of our December 2020 book club pick. Uh, Rira, I know that um, for January, we're starting off with the complete 180 of a breezy rom-com. Uh, why don't you let us know what we're reading as the first book of the year? Okay, so this book has been a lot of people's favorite from uh, last year. And it's The Magical Language of Others by E.J. Ko. So this is a nonfiction book. It's a memoir. And um, apparently I chose to cry <laughs> in the beginning of 2021. Uh, <laughs> it's it's a lot more serious than when Dimple met Rishi. Um, since I have not read this book, I don't know the trigger warnings, but I've heard that there's a trigger warning for eating disorders. So um, just so you guys know that that's probably going to be an aspect Wee. in the book. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been a while since I've been bummed out by a book. So I'm looking forward to reading this. Okay, <laughs> okay. The thing is, the thing is, like, I don't think you will be bummed out by this book because... Um, like for me, like I, it's the same thing with Pachinko, you know, I feel like it's gonna, it's gonna hit me more personally and it's gonna make me cry <laughs> because it's gonna remind me of like my own family and, um, and my own personal baggage, I guess, um. <laughs> I guess. So, um, that's why I say that it's probably gonna make me cry. Uh, it's been on, it's been in my TBR list for a very long time. And considering that a lot of people recommended it to to the book club, uh, I am looking forward to it, but also very anxious about it. Yeah. All right. Well, you got a whole month to read along with us. Uh, we'll be talking about this book at the end of the month. But on that note, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Books and Boba. Thank you for sticking around with us for 2020. Um, I hope you all have a great new year. Uh, 2021 is upon us. And... Like, I don't want to jinx it, but surely, surely this year will be will be better than the last, right? 
Yeah, don't jinx it. We (laughs) said that in 2019 and 2020 turned out to be far worse. (laughs) But I do wish everyone the best start to this year. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for listening. And uh, we'll see you next time on Books and Boba. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Ri Ryu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Hey, Brian, did you go to Saturday school as a kid? I sure did. Did you? Totally. Well, at our podcast, Saturday School, we don't teach a language, but we pass along the culture that we do know. And that's Asian American pop culture. Ada is a journalist, and I'm a professor and film festival programmer. We've watched a lot of great Asian American movies, and we want you to watch them too. Come listen to us as we look back at the pioneering films that have led us to today. 